Losing control of your trains, the functions, or even worse, your decoders going into meltdown? You might need a snubber. Let's talk about it. In recent times, I've spent a ton of time experimenting with electronics. This is to help the modeler to understand with limited knowledge and limited budget like myself. Trust me, if I can do it, you can do it as well. Stick around at the end to some other electronic goodness, tips and techniques. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> we'll talk about some of the symptoms in just a little more detail. So I will put the link to this below. Mark Gurry's has a, a very in-depth website, depending on how far, how much down this rabbit hole you want to learn. So these are some of the basic symptoms in order of severity that I have gleaned from his website. This not, might not manifest itself as anything that from day to day you're really gonna notice without maybe some of the other symptoms. So what that is, is with the decoder is getting further away from the booster. So this is something that might not apparently show itself, not under normal conditions with your eye, unless you're gonna go and get an oscilloscope out and which what we'll show you very shortly. So Mark describes the, probably the first visible symptom whether you might need an RC filter is. So he describes it as losing control of a train or locomotive. So where this comes into, as I explained before, this is where you start losing control of a locomotive. You might try going faster or slower and it's just not responding or taking some time, too much lag time. And also where my issue has been on occasions is on a particular part of the track where I might use a bell or a horn. It's just taken just a little bit of lag time to uh, to actually turn itself on or off, on or off. So this is a bit of an interesting one that didn't even dawn on me this has actually happened. So this is regarding CV29. The next visible sign is relating to CV29, which refers to the analog bit, which by default is turned on. So after a short circuit has occurred and the re decoder reboots itself, you guessed it, it turns into confusion mode. And that's when we're getting locomotives that's taken off because obviously track power doesn't fluctuate that much on a DCC layer. Where we can look at altering this is when we're programming our locomotives on the programming track is actually with that CV29 analog needs, to, it, it's, it's probably suggested if you're only gonna run on a DCC world that you would turn it off at that point in time. Hey you, have you subscribed to my channel yet? Hit that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming content. And if you'd like to buy me a coffee or buy me a beer, depending on what part of the world you're in, every little bit counts to help my channel to keep growing and keep bringing out content such as this. So the next one, obviously, is we're going up in severity a little bit. This one, described by Mark, is obviously a little bit harder to detect as well. So this is where we're looking at the working memory of the DCC decoder. Now I won't go into ultimate a lot of detail about that, but in short, the locomotive will do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So what he's suggesting to fix this is, is just roll the locomotive off, taking it off track power, putting it back on, and that nine times out of 10 will write the problem for that particular symptom. Some corruption of some of the CV data that might actually end up changing some of them. So it might be a total reprogram at that point in time if the issue is that severe. The next one is catastrophic in effect. So when we get in voltage spikes and you will see the high and low of what I'll show you very shortly on the oscilloscope is you'll get some spikes and we can be upwards of 50 volts. So you can imagine most decoders can't take 50 volts. So with that, we're getting a massive spike over a millisecond or so, which in effect, the only way you're gonna know that that's occurring is your locomotive will start going into meltdown. It will melt the decoder and can destroy locomotives. So some of you must be thinking, well, do I need the RC filter at all? I'm not really seeing any of these, these symptoms. However, some of them you can't, it's a lot harder to see. Under certain conditions, Mark in his website is suggesting yes, you probably do. So we got boosters between five and six amps, he's suggesting yes, um, but there's sort of provisos to that. So if you've got a track bus, Imperial is more than 30 or up to 30 feet long or 10 meters in, in metric terms in my part of the world. Or you're under that but you've, and your track bus is not wound 
and obviously if you've got boosters higher than that is where you, you can have some issues. So if you've got six, seven, eight, nine, 10 amp boosters, even more on some, the voltage spikes, if you've got an issue, is gonna be greater and you're more likely to be at that other end, scale number five, where you can start doing damage to locomotives and your decoders. So what does the RC filter actually do? So I'll be brutally honest up front in regards to the RC filter is only really a band-aid fix. If you've got good wiring practices, when we meet that criteria of ampage out of boosters, twisted pair wires, trying to keep it away from all other interference, you're not likely to have the issues that some people are seeing. So in effect, good wiring practices will eliminate, maybe not totally eliminate, but at least minimize the electrical interferences that we're talking about. What do the RC filters do? They're a way of keeping the waveform fidelity between the cab bus, the control bus, and the track bus effectively. They will address the ringing. So the ringing we'll show you shortly is like an oscillating line at the top of, of the signal. RC filters will also filter out what we're calling that noise in the signal and the voltage spikes, which is caused by the locomotive's motors and also the intermittent shorts that we time to time will get on a model railway. All this type of noise we didn't see or any issues we had on DCC, sorry, DC layouts because we weren't using high tech electronics to run our trains like we are now. So if you've made it this far and you think that you need an RC filter, you might be asking, well, where do I need to install the RC filter? So between the rail A and the rail B, we'll call it, at the end of the longest run or runs, if you've got numerous power districts like I do. But you might be thinking, well, do I put the RC filter at the front end near the booster? Yes, the RC, the booster will have some RC filtering in it, but that does the job at the front end. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate along the rest of the bus run, the noise and the spikes as we've spoken of before. On occasions, you might have some at various points along the long on the run if it might be an extra long run one in the middle so this is where it's obviously testing running trains which is ultimately a lot of fun anyway is you install the rc filter at the point that you're having the issues on physically on the rail on the flip side where shouldn't i install rc filters if you're just purely running your layout with no current detection so you're not running a computer program like train control or i train that has isolated further isolated blocks to show where a, a train is on, a, on the layer at any given time. If you are to install one of these on one of those runs from on what I'm gonna call the downside or the output side of the occupancy dissection, it will actually give off a false detection because obviously using a circuit that goes across the, the A and the B rail, so it actually, which is drawing down just a little bit of current, but it will be enough to fire off that occupancy detection module. How do I fix that? So when you've got the wires, the A and B rail that are coming in on the input side of the occupancy dissection module, that's where you put the RC filter and then that should do the job for the tracks that are being fed by that particular occupancy detection module. So the next question is, what are these RC filters? Can I make my own? In short, the question is yes, you can make your own. There are two electrical components depending on the size of your layer. I will put in the link below the values for the HO and the N and the O scale because they will, they will be slightly different. But in short, they're cheap little electronics that you can solder yourself together. So for a HO layout, we're looking at a 100 ohm resistor at half a watt. And for the capacitor side of things, we're looking at a 0.1 microfarad ceramic capacitor and all up in my dollars, Australian dollars, you're looking at literally maybe a dollar. So just more on the capacitor. Also with the voltages that we're using, something that can at least handle 25 volts should be more than enough for what we're looking at doing. If you don't feel comfortable about being able to make your own, there are some companies, and I think NCE are one, maybe Digitrax, they do actually make one on a printed circuit board. It's just a matter of the end of your bus. You just plug the two terminal blocks in and away you go. Before we go over to the workbench and have a look at the oscilloscope there as on screen, let's go and get a few words from my sponsor, PCBWay.com. So over to the guys and girls there. This video is proudly sponsored by PCBWay.com. If you're a tinkerer, inventor, or an advanced electrical engineer, 
PCB way have you covered. We are seriously missing out. We are passionate about PCBs, but PCB way do not stop there. They also offer 3D print, injection molding or CNC machining, assembly or basic PCB manufacturing. They can do it all for a very competitive price. Check out their awesome services in the link below and also a special offer to anyone who supports my channel. So before we dive into the actual DCC signal as such, we might just actually just explain what, uh, what we're looking at here on the screen. So you can see a horizontal line in the middle there where we've got our waveform equally spread across that horizontal line. Now, in short, we've got, as you can liken this to maybe to an A and a B rail. So we'll call the A rail on the top, B rail on the bottom. So you can imagine when the DCC signal's coming in, we're either on or we're off. So say that's A rail is on, and that's, uh, um, on this case, uh, a V max of 15.4 volts. That means on the flip side, the V minimum is showing 15.3 volts negative. So that's where we get that other, the VPP, which is 30.7 volts. So that's the swing between high and low of 30.7 volts. So just quickly, so with this concept in mind, the DCC signal has no concept of what I'm gonna call polarity. So one of the misnomers that we, we talk about in DCC, and I was until I learnt this, that the binary signal that comes out of the DCC command station has no concept of, of a negative, so to speak. You can see on the screen there, yeah, but hang on, we've got a, a minus 15.3. So in binary world, that would be considered an undefined value. And obviously this is going a little bit deeper than what we probably need to. However, you can see that the, the track voltage on the displayed oscilloscope does display the presence of a plus and a minus signal, but it sees the, the minus voltage as a reference of point of floating. So I will put a link of something below there what that actually all means. But in short, we talk about phasing, which is the on and off and not polarity at the track. That's all we need to know. So the picture here on the screen we're looking at is the waveform directly out of my Roco Z21 black box. So this is probably the datum point you need to work from. So you can see it's a reasonable, reasonably good form for the DCC signal as you'd expect it as it's straight out the back of the, the command station. So we've got nice straight rises, reasonably sharp curves. There obviously is a little bit of ringing on the high and low, but that's uh, just something that uh, could be inherent to my oscilloscope or the environment that my Z21 is actually sitting in. So this is the end of the 10 meter or 30 foot run on my model railway. So let's have a look what we're gonna be getting on sort of levels we're gonna be getting on the oscilloscope regarding our DCC waveform and the like. Also at this point in time, I should point out that this is without an RC filter installed. So we're just gonna cycle through just to get, uh, let the system do its thing and then we'll push that okay button and then we'll pause, we will pause the, the signal and then I will go over to a, a snapshot of that and we'll have a quick discussion. What we're looking here is some DCC signal, uh, which is a preamble. So there's no locomotives running, there's no functions going or anything. It's just purely the DCC, signal coming in and no other information at this point in time okay so on the left of the screen there is the waveform at the end of the run with the rc filter and the right is without so as you can see obviously we got different vmax voltages a little bit but on the whole um the actual waveform integrity looks good on both so um obviously we looked at the one on the left, sorry, the one on the right without the filter. So if you if you don't have any issues of really high peaks, um, which can cause damage to decoders and degrade DCC signals, you wouldn't expect the filter actually would do a lot the other end. So it's not actually changing the waveform that much on my particular one. So moving forward, I am having a little issue every now and again when I'm running through one of my hidden yards where um, if I want to blow a horn or something or control the train, I'm just momentarily losing control of it. This is the end of the video. Yes, it's been a bit of me waffling on, a little bit of tech talk. I'm in, I'm, I'm in my infancy learning this stuff as well. So for me, 
trying to teach this as well is just um, increasing my learning knowledge and my working knowledge of what these are all about. I've been doing a little bit of testing and I'm sort of, I've, there's a few points that I will be putting some maybe mid midpoint of my, my booster. As I said, I've got occupancy detection, so I've got to be a little bit careful where I need to put it on the input side of the detection units. So a few little takeaways. It's a very easy circuit to make. You just need to solder two of the, one end of the resistor and one leg of the capacitor together. Really as simple as that. As always, I've got three questions. Make sure you comment below on if any of these are relevant to you. So number one is, have you used an RC, RC filter or you think you might need to use one? Number two, if so, what sort of tweaks could I look at doing that I might have in a tour or that you've used that you've worked out really well? Or if there's ways that you're detecting some of these, these issues, because some of them are not, some of the symptoms are not that easy to discover what they are. And number three, as always, how could I do better either doing these videos or something that I've omitted that I can set the record straight, so to speak. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe, which feeds that greedy little YouTube algorithm to hopefully, if you like my videos, put more videos in front of you that you can watch coming up into the future. Also, make sure you click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming content. Give it a big thumbs up. If you think it's a good video, it's rather a large assumption on my point part. If you think it's a good video, that would be great. See you next time.